Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Filato. Today we're here to do a little mailbag action. The Giants season is over, 2022 season. 2023 offseason has begun, not really, not technically, but in all senses and purposes. There's a lot of talk already about Daniel Jones' contract coming up, Saquon Barkley, other free agents the Giants have. But we're going to talk about some of that today, and we're going to talk about other big picture things. It's a mailbag. You never know where it's going to go. So let's, without further ado, get this thing rolling. And so we'll start with Big Jones Energy, who asks, I love Daniel Jones, but I understand his limitations. Do you believe his issues with seeing the entire field and throwing outside of the hashes is something he can work on so they can improve the offense overall? DJ made good progress in year one, and I can see him blooming in year two with a good offense. I think if Brian Dable and Joe Shane don't think he can work on it, then there's no situation where they should bring Daniel Jones back. So I do believe it's something that he can get comfortable with something that he can work on. And I believe it's something that he has to work on in order to take his game to the next level. I think it's possible, Dan. I do. But we need to see him use every aspect of the field, as we've said, and stretch the field vertically from number two, reduce splits, deep flag routes, things like that. Stuff that I think is well within the bounds of something that he can accomplish, but we have to see it more consistently. Yeah, that's a great question by you, Big Jones Energy. And something came up recently on my timeline. I forgot who sent it. It might have been, I don't know if it was you or something. No, it was, it was, it was definitely uh, Tamano who sent it to me. It was Daniel Jones. To, to, I don't know if you remember this play. Like, I think it was last season where he motioned Deion Lewis. It might have been two seasons. Did we have Lewis last season? It might have been two seasons ago. Yeah, two he motioned seasons ago. Deion Lewis outside and then. There was like a, was like a, a route com. I forgot what the route combination was to the left, but it was essentially he threw the honey hole shot with Deion Lewis kind of running that that route, and it was back shoulder. It was perfect by the sideline. Safety couldn't make the play. Was and, it in the red zone? No, it was actually backed up on like the Giants' own four or five yard line. Um, okay, so all right, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put it out there again, or maybe I'll retweet or something. But he was like, this was the only hole shot I can remember from Jones, and I was thinking like about any others that I've seen. There haven't been too many over the years. I think, look, if they do decide to re-sign him, in my mind, Nick is 100% right. It's them telling us they believe he can improve this because I don't think it's Nick and I as the only two people and you as well because you just said it in your question, even though you said, look, I'm a Daniel Jones, love Daniel Jones kind of guy, and it even is in your like, Twitter handle, but I appreciate that you can understand his limitations so far and not have to be like, it's only good because – if they make this decision, they're also saying that they believe th that he can eventually do this. They're not going to resign a guy who's not going to stretch the field, who's not going to use all areas of the field. They're not going to believe in a guy like that. And I also believe he can make progress in this way, which is the only reason I'm interested in resigning him as well. Because I look at these quarterbacks who are left, with the exception of Purdy, who hasn't had that many starts. Even if you look at the strides Jalen Hurts has made as, as an anticipatory thrower and throw overall, a lot of what he did was outside the hashes this year and stretching the field. I know you're going to say some of those weren't tight window throws, but what I'm looking for is some of those throws like he made against the Giants in week 14 where he had Quez Watkins in the slot and he makes that outbreaker and he, and he runs that outbreaker to the outside and the ball's out before, you know, the ball's out early and it hits the sideline. So when it comes to Jones, all the passers besides Purdy left in the playoffs are the ones who are stretching the field are the ones who are using all areas of the field are the ones who are throwing not just in the first 20 yards like we saw most of the Giants this year and outside the hashes and beating cover two and beating and, and hitting those hole shots or when they're playing cover one like the Eagles did and pressing up and playing all man coverage and driving on the stick routes there's solutions there's ways to they're, they're beating that and they're finding out way and they're figuring out ways to force the defense to do other things. So those are all things Daniel Jones needs to do, or he's not going to make it long-term here. And so if they resign him, they believe he can do that as well. And I think he can too. So we'll see what happens there. I'm right there with you, Dan Ray wronger asks, how do you both update your priors as it relates to scouting? Is there a process? I'm thinking about your conversation last podcast about Neil who nearly everybody preferred and has struggled relative to his peers. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what do you do? You understand what that exactly means, uh, Nick? By update your priors, does he mean just like update your your grades? I don't know if he's necessarily talking about grades, but maybe our overall opinion on these players, how they fared uh, in college, and now that how they translated in year one in the NFL. Yeah, I think that's a great question, then, and a good thing to discuss because I don't think it, one important thing is to not stick with your <laughs> with your pre draft evaluations. That's like one of the worst things you can do in this business or in general in life when it comes to evaluating football. Don't stick with your pre don't have take lock 
Like just that's what I call it. Take lock. You're locked in on your take. Even somebody like Daniel Jones, who both Nick and I had a second round grade on when he came out of Duke. We've since adjusted our opinions on him and what he's able to do on the football field. We wouldn't want to resign a second round grade type of guy right now. We think there's more to it based on what Brian Dable unlocked. And that goes for a lot of different players. Josh Allen, I had a I was not high on coming out of Wyoming. And obviously, I'm not just going to sit there and say, he still sucks. I'm waiting for the day for him to suck again. So I think as far as it comes to Neil and and players like that who struggle a bit in, in the early going or someone like maybe like you're comparing him to like, um, who would you say would be like, I guess would be Charles Cross would be the good example, right? I that think was a player. So, yeah. That was a player we were high on anyway. Nick and I both had him in that elite, in that first three, that tier of tackles with those first three guys anyway. So um, you got to adjust based on what you see, because there's a big thing that happens when you go from college to the NFL. There's a huge jump in the speed of the game. There's a complete, there's a lot of unknowns coming from college. Like they're facing completely le different level of competition. Some of these guys are facing terrible teams and opponents week after week after week, guys, they'll never see at the NFL level. Like Ellerson Smith looked honestly awesome on film. When I watched him <laughs> on his film, I'm like this dude is going to be a special, could be a special player for the giants. He hasn't made it with the giants or come anywhere close. And I think part of that is because when I watched him, he's going up against tackles that are just never going to play in the NFL and are so much worse than anyone who ever plays in the NFL at offense of tackle so you have to really adjust big time i think because the speed of the nfl game and the difference in competition is just a completely different thing than co the college uh game you also got to put things into context charles cross the big concern with him was its projection in terms of his run blocking because he was coming from the air raid didn't really necessarily run block all that much but he was recruited by an offense that didn't run the air raid and he ran block a lot in high school and when he did have his run blocking reps you saw pieces of his game that you thought could be dominating but maybe it wasn't all there and there wasn't a huge sample size and in terms of evan neal it's somewhat of the opposite because charles cross seems like the pro the projection in college ended up materializing in the nfl with evan neal we said evan neal has all of the tools to be successful but he has some balance issues specifically when he's run blocking he finds his way onto the ground too much and he doesn't play within the framework of his body he lunges a lot but we figured that would be correctable and i still think it is correctable. i think evan neal will be fine but those issues in college for evan neal were exacerbated in the NFL, because you're playing against faster players, better players, players that are more technically sound and stronger players. So they were able to basically exploit all of Evan Neal's biggest vulnerabilities in college. And those were vulnerabil vulnerabilities, Dan, that we talked about on this podcast. I don't think I expected it to be as glaring, but I want to say if you go back and you listen to the Evan Neal podcast, we said his first year might be a little rocky. It might not be as bad as Andrew Thomas, but it might be a little rocky, but eventually he'll come into his own. I still kind of maintain that right now. Now, I wish he was a little bit more consistent in year one, but I also want to be fair to the kid and say that he did suffer a knee injury midway through the season that kind of stifled his development and growth and then was kind of thrown back into the fire. But even right. with that, I still think we're seeing those same issues that we saw in college. It's just now he needs to rectify them and hopefully kind of just adapt to the speed so they're not exploited as frequently. Yeah, that's a good answer there. And he also asks, Dan, are you an Arsenal fan? No, I'm not an Arsenal fan yet. I have not made my plunge yet into picking a team that I support from the English Premier League, the EPL. Uh, it's been a long run. I, I've made the decision that I won't really pick a team until I decide to go all in and like learn the players, watch every week, get into maybe like a fantasy league or something to get me hooked. Until then, I won't pick a team. I did enjoy that day watching Arsenal in the bar, Arsenal bar with some fans. They crushed Tottenham that day. I bet on Arsenal minus 165, hit that bet, which was definitely something I wanted to do. I don't want to lose bets. So they made me happy that day. But in the end, it's going to be tough. There's a lot of different people pulling me in a lot of different directions. My brother wants me to be a Chelsea fan. One of my best friends, shout out Brett Childs, wants me to be a Liverpool fan. Well, he doesn't even want me to be a Liverpool fan. He's a Liverpool fan. He wants me to pick like a random team, not in London. And just because like the enjoyment of when that team hits, but I don't know, like EPL is such a baseball esque league where it's like the only teams that are really going to have a chance are the teams that pay the money and buy the players. So I don't really want to pick some random team outside of London. That's not spending money, Brett. So I'm going to stand by that. We'll see what happens there. But until I could di dive more into the league, I'm not going to pick a team. I think our good friend, mutual friend, Christian Harrington, shout out to Christian is an Arsenal fan, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I think yeah. he is. Shout out to Christian. Arsenal's a good team. Look, I, they're they're coming up, but we'll see what happens there. I haven't picked a team yet. Okay. 
MPGman2275, one of the most Twitter names you'll find. Spot Track says the Giants have $45 million in cap space. If we sign Daniel Jones to a 30 to $35 million a dollar a year deal, which I actually think it might will end up potentially higher than that, and then have to tag Zach on Barkley again, I'll entertain the question, but I stand by my statement I made maybe one or two, one and a half years ago, or whenever I've made it, I've stayed by it. There will be no scenario where the Giants tag Saquon Barkley unless they re-sign him. The Giants are not that kind of team. They're not going to force him to play on the franchise tag. He's not going to play on the franchise tag, and they don't want to get to the point where they have to do that with Barkley. It's just not how Mara operates, in my mind. Anyway, let's say this happens. Can you guys give a breakdown of what we can do after that to stay in cap health? The options could be trade for wide receiver one, sign a corner two, inside linebacker, interior offensive line. Just wondering what to expect this offseason. So I'll start by saying this on this question. I've heard what Joe Shane has had to say about staying in cap health. And I think for now, it's not only a good plan, but something he'll adhere to. But in the future, when you get close to that Super Bowl window, you have to throw out the idea of staying in cap health. That's when you have to start doing the things like what the Eagles, the 49ers, the Cowboys, all these teams that are cl- and Chiefs are doing close to that Super Bowl window or in that Super Bowl window are doing. They're not worrying about cap health. They're starting to add the void year contracts. They're starting to push the cap back. They're starting to manipulate the cap. Once you get to that point when you're in a Super Bowl window, that's when I think you start to do it. I kind of fell into a trap last two off seasons ago when David Gettleman did that, uh, kind of put the cart before the horse, as some might say, and really went all in on it. They weren't really in a Super Bowl window. It wasn't the time to do it. Yes, they had the rookie contract with Daniel Jones, but Daniel Jones didn't prove yet and I, I still think he hasn't proven it, no offense, that they're a guaranteed Super Bowl contender every year or in that Super Bowl window. They're in the playoff window this year, but not the Super Bowl window. So I think you have to wait to that point, but he will stay in cap health. So if they do what you just said, sign Jones that contract, tag Barkley, or even end up giving Barkley the contract, if he wants to stay in cap health, what you'll most likely see is a pretty quiet offseason in free agency. Maybe a signing a little bit bigger than the Glowinski, maybe a couple other small ones, but for the most part, if he wants to stay in cap health, he can't spend in this year's free agency because, or even really trade for a wide receiver one. And I've said, let's trade for Brandon Ayuk. And I would do that because I personally don't care about staying in cap health, really, to be honest. I'd, I'm okay getting into a little unhealthy cap situation again, like the Gettleman years. I don't want to go crazy with it. And if I do it, I hope I hit a player like Ayuk, I think is a guaranteed hit because he's young. And I think his skill set is much better than people realize. I, I personally think he's the best kept secret at receiver in the NFL right now and a huge value buy. But if you're going to do any of that stuff, you also have to understand you have to resign Andrew Thomas at some point. You have to resign Dexter Lawrence at some point. Maybe you're resigning Xavier McKinney. Maybe you're resigning Julian Love. I don't know. So with all those things in mind, and then eventually you get down the line, right? And Kayvon Thibodeau's contract isn't going to last forever, this rookie deal. At some point, that's going up too. So to stay in cap health, they can't really go crazy this free agency if they are going to make the core Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. The Brendan Ayuk thing, I just don't understand why the 49ers would trade him next season just because he still has years left on that contract. But in terms of the cap health, the idea I think for like, them would be just to get ahead of it, like to get that 25th pick. You they're in their window, though, bro. They're in their window yeah. right now. It just depends if they feel, yeah, they'll probably just do what the, you're right, like what the Eagles and Cowboys and some of those teams have done of just pushing Chiefs and just kind of get themselves into that void year stuff and pushing the cap and all that. So you're probably right. That, but, yeah, go ahead. It also gets interesting too because if they do settle on Brock Birdie actually being their quarterback moving forward, you have literally like the cheapest contract at the quarterback position because they already have if a shit trade landing. Yeah, exactly. If you trade you get lands, that contract which, off, which I'm sure they would if they were to settle on someone like Brock Purdy, but that's yeah. yet to be determined. But in terms of the Giants cap situation, sure. I think you have to start with Leonard Williams. What are you doing about that? This dude is going to count for 32 freaking million dollars next year against the cap. That is unconscionable, dude. That is the third highest non-quarterback contract in the entire league behind two left tackles. That's insane to think about. So you have to and do by something the way, about that. Nick, I don't want to cut you off, but I want to throw this in because it's interesting. By the way, not only is the third highest paid contract among all non-quarterback, some you think like, oh, okay, right. Like it's the third highest paid. They must have like left it all for that year. Fine. They pushed it. I think it's Gettleman. Like, fine. He put no. There's somehow still a four point five million dollar dead cap hit the year after in 2024. Yeah, no. Just like it's the one of the most poorly structured contracts you'll ever see. But obviously it's Dave Gettleman. But 
but yeah, just go go back into what you're saying. Yeah, Joe Shane that. kicked that down the the can because of David Gettleman. So you would have yeah. to do something about Leonard Williams. Uh, just overall cap hit. I don't know. I think it's a considerable amount of dead cap. The Giants opt to cut him, and I think there's two years of dead cap. But don't don't quote me on that. So that's an option, but is it the wisest option? And then obviously you have Kenny Galladay's contract too, which you can get out of, but there will be dead cap in the 2023 season. So you just kind of have to feel out those really hefty contracts. Leonard Williams, I still feel like is a very valuable player. And I'm sure we'll probably have questions about him within this, uh, within this mailbag, Dan, but let's just uh, kind of dive into him right now for a second, just because we're on the topic. I think you have to have Leonard Williams on, well, maybe not have to, but it, it's smart to have Leonard Williams on this roster next year because there is nobody absolutely nobody behind Dexter Lawrence right now and I get Leonard Williams had like two and a half sacks this year getting paid a ton of money that's unacceptable but he was injured most of the season and we watched the film you could see Leonard Williams he's still playing at a high level he might not be getting home which is something that's kind of throughout his career that's happened he had one season where I only think he had a sack I think he had a half sack in week 17 back in like was at the 20 19 season when the Giants yeah. traded for him when, when he was with the Jets and he wasn't really being utilized to his maximum capacity but you release Leonard Williams, you eat that dead cap. Who the hell is behind Dexter Lawrence right now? There's like nobody back there. Yeah, there isn't anybody back there. And that's the that's the big question. I think the bigger question with Williams won't be, do you release him? They're not going to release him. It's do you extend, the, extend his contract yes, to restructure it? And that's the bigger question. I think somebody actually asked that. So I'll, I'll leave that one for now. It's either going to be on this mailbag or the next one. But that's the bigger question because that adds a lot more into it. But yeah. They don't have any depth on the D-line, so it's it's a tough spot there, too. Okay, Daryl asks, are there any three, four defensive ends in the draft that will fit the Giants' scheme? To go along with Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams this is actually good timing, Daryl. Um, also, is there a middle linebacker in free agency you guys have your eyes on? A middle linebacker in free agency, Tremaine Edmonds, would be the guy that I have my eyes on right now. But there are a couple other ones, uh, like older recycled ones, like the John Bostics of the world, which don't really interest me all that much. Tremaine Edmonds is still like 24 years old, finished five years in the NFL, incredibly long, can be an effective player at the second level. Joe Shane knows him personally because Joe Shane helped draft him. So that would definitely be the name to pay attention to. And in terms of the three, four defensive ends or, or the uh, defensive tackles, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, there are plenty in this draft. I don't have the names necessarily in front of me, but there are guys that could be considered in round one. I don't think the Giants are going to go in that direction, even though Joe Shane and and the Buffalo Bills did that for, for quite a while. They had a more well-rounded roster at that time. But you can always find players in the draft who can be plug-and-play guys on day two and then into the early parts of day three. I don't have a list of the names in front of me, but I know there are some really solid players coming out of college this year that can fill that void. Yeah, all draft related stuff in this podcast or the next one is not going to be a answer with any kind of spe specificity. Specificity is that what it is? Specificity? How do you? Yeah, specificity. Yeah, all right, I nailed it on the second go. Any kind of specificity because we haven't done any of our draft prep yet. Really, Nick's starting to get into it. I yeah, need, I, need I, I started doing prep. some of my first guys. I'm really excited, man, about it. It's gonna it's be going to be fun. But I'm not. I'm not doing it just yet, and I'll probably won't do it till after the Super Bowl. Um, Got to give yourself a little bit of a break when you're doing this nonstop 24 seven. But having said that, I think it is interesting and I'll get into the middle linebacker part to go a little bit into what Nick said with the bills, right? Like they're taking guys like AJ Epinesa, you know, in the range of a Xavier McKinney and Basha and all these guys on the defensive line, they've really gone really heavy drafting defensive line. And then what happens? They play the Bengals and they can't stop the run against three backup offensive linemen. And they, can't get any pressure against three backup offensive linemen. So, I mean, I look at that blueprint and I'm almost like, I really don't want to go in that direction. That didn't look good at all. And, I, and look, you got to get the evaluations right. FNS has been absolutely terrible for them, in my opinion. Just doesn't add. A, I, he's exactly what I thought he would be coming at. It's true. He's exactly what I thought he would no, be I, coming at. I know. I'm, I'm laughing because Epinesa, I, I like AJ Epinesa, you know, Iowa Hawkeye. As a, college, know, player, yeah. as a college player, but he didn't have that athletic ability, but if you are a longtime listener of this podcast, we know why AJ Epinesa makes Dan smile every time his name gets brought up. Yeah, of course, of course. And it, some people might get that inside joke, but like, I, and look, we're only a few years into this thing, but I think I was right about that one. I mean, it was so obvious watching him at Iowa. He's beating up on players he's never going to see at the NFL level at the offense tackle, at uh, the offense tackle position. He had no, he had no traits that made me think he'd be a, good, a great NFL pass rusher. Uh, maybe he's good against the run. I don't know. I just know he's like a nothing 
as a pass rusher right now for the Bills. And anyway, the point is, like, those types of players are going to draft these guys high. It, it, me, it, to me, it limits your ceiling when you draft three, four defensive ends high unless they have big-time pass rushing upside. So as far as draft goes, I'd probably still look to day three for that type of stuff. But as far as the middle linebackers go, I'm actually out in the Tremaine Edwins sweepstakes unless the Giants decide to move on from Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley or even one of the two, then I would consider an Edmonds. But Edmonds is going to get a mega contract. They don't have the cap space or the cap health to give him a mega contract, as well as Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, Andrew Thomas, and Dexter Lawrence, plus whatever you want to do with the McKinney, the Loves, and all those guys of the world. But I do have my eye on David Long, the inside linebacker from Tennessee, okay. who everybody I've seen, the Ben Solo, everybody who breaks down films like this is the best kept secret at inside linebacker. I haven't watched him yet. And if the Giants actually have some kind of relation, uh, you know, if we start to see connection to the to them and the Giants to him and the Giants and free agency David Long I'll start to perk up and I'll start to look into him because a lot of people like his film but David Long is the first one and the second one is TJ Edwards of the Eagles like I said a few podcasts ago the Eagles are have a lot of free agents coming up and maybe not so much cap space to sign them Edwards could easily squeak for through there and I think he's just a good he's not going to cost that much right like he's not gonna, you're not he doesn't have the athleticism the draft profile or anything like that to really become a player who I think at least will be this mega contract like a Tremaine Edmonds will get. So you you save some money there and you and take a player like that. Edwards, Edmonds, man, a lot of Eds getting thrown yeah, around here, man. A lot of Eds. Sure. Lou, Lou asks, how's grilled and dry rubbed wings sound? And in an ideal offseason for the Giants long term, what's your top five priorities? So you can handle the grilled or dry rub question. I think it's grilled and dry, like wings grill. Dry rub wings are all are awesome. They're very underrated. There's actually a place in Morristown that I go to um, now, a Horseshoe Tavern, where they have okay, unbelievable, yeah. yeah, unbelievable dry rub wings. I got, I've tried all their wings. The dry rub is by far their best, and that's rare for me to say about wet versus dry wings. I usually like the wet wings to the sauce, but dry like rub wet wings, dry, that's good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the dry rub wings are good depending on on where you get them from. Grilled wings good with a good dry rub i still think the best option for wings there's a place down in in uh belmar that i used to go to it unfortunately shut down shout out jersey shore barbecue place was unbelievable i don't know why it shut down people were just not didn't realize it was there and they used to smoke their wings for like six to eight hours and then after the smoke deep fry them that's the best version of a wing the smoke for six hours into the deep fry that's just how you that's how you maximize a wing in my opinion. So I'll stand by that. As far as the ideal off season for the giants, top five priorities, that's a tough question. Um, like top five priorities for what I would want them to do this off season. So open-ended right now. And I can see them going in a lot of different directions, but um, where, would you have, do you have something you would say there immediately? It sounded like you did. Yeah. So, I'm not 100% certain on on direction because we don't know who the hell the quarterback is. We don't know if Saquon Barkley is going to be back. Let's mm -hmm. go under the presumption that Daniel Jones is back. Saquon Barkley, Say he's back, he's not back, whatever. I don't even know if running back would be there because I think they could spend a day three pick and be okay there. But you have to look at linebacker position. And it's weird when you bring up the linebacker because linebacker is not thought of as one of the biggest needs on a football team. But I really think if the Giants want to compete in the playoffs, they need to upgrade the linebacker position. And I'm sure they're aware of that. I don't know if that's the biggest need though, right? Because you mm -hmm. look at the wide receiver position too. There's a lot of injuries there. There's a lot of free agents there. And you look at the NFL, offenses, Mo are most successful when they're creating explosive plays. The Giants were dead last in explosive plays. I know we bring that up a lot, but that is really important. Like they were behind the Rams. Yeah. They were behind the Pittsburgh Steelers. They weren't creating any explosive plays, yet they made it to the final eight NFL teams. So if you were to add a true playmaking difference maker type of wide receiver, like even a Garrett Wilson, who the Jets drafted in the top 10 last year, if you were to find a player like that, which I don't know if there are, I mean, I know there's going to be guys like Jordan Addison at a USC. There's going to be some solid receivers coming out of this draft. That I don't think this receiver draft is nearly as explosive or as deep as the last two receiver drafts. There'll still be some good players, no doubt, but I don't know where the Giants are going to want to draft them. But I start with wide receiver, in, inside linebacker, cornerback. I think interior defensive line depth is really important, but I don't know if it would be in the top five. You got interior offensive line because Nick Gates and John Feliciano are both free agents. You got to figure that position out. And then if Saquon's there, you know, running back would kind of bleed into that. I think you want some sort of safety depth. Like you can really use anything if you're the New York Giants. I think you can use another tight end. If you want to get into 12 personnel packages, you need an upgrade over whoever's playing next to 
Daniel Bellinger. Like the Giants are going to go in the season with Chris Myrick and Lawrence Cager as their tight end too, right? So right. kind of pick whatever position you want to discuss. The Giants need some sort of infusion of talent into that position right now. And that's just the reality of the fact. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you, you nailed it. I would say as far as priorities go, top priorities go. I'll start by saying linebacker. The Giants just can't. They, they have no ceiling next year, in my opinion, if they don't do something at linebacker. If they just said, all right, we got other priorities. We got to find receivers. We got to find this. Got to find that. And they just like didn't do anything in linebacker. Let's see about Jared Davis next year. Let's see about a uh, big jump from Micah McFadden. Darren Beaver's coming back off an ACL. Let's rely on that. Oh, uh, Jalen Smith. Like If that type of thing happened, that would be a disaster. I see no ceiling. So I'll start with linebacker. The second one for me, at least, is cornerback because I, I like Cordell Flott. I don't know how I feel about Aaron Robinson at all. There's just not enough tape there in Wink system. And I know in my mind, I'm very confident in saying that in order for Wink to maximize this defense from a pers- from a schematic standpoint, he needs more reliability at that corner position. He needs better talent at that corner position. So that would be two for me, linebacker, then corner. I guess we're going down the list. I'd probably say as far as pri- priority is different than pr- like um, preference, because I would prefer cent- I, I've talked about my shout out Uncle Steve. Me and him are big believers in center, the center position in the NFL. I view it almost like the middle linebacker position as insanely underrated as far as winning and losing goes. I like Nick Gates as a person. I love the comeback story. Feliciano's all right. I want a big time center at some point on this Giants team. I think it would set the whole tone for the offensive line and make everything look so much better with a good center. So I'll put center in there just because I want it. It's not a, it's not a prioritized need. The Giants could probably get away with Nick Gates there if they resign him or Feliciano if they resign him or whatever. But I would like a bit big upgrade there as well. And then wide receiver, of course, has to be up there as well. Like, look, there is a scenario where they come back on this thing and they say Isaiah Hodgins. Wondell Robinson recovers well from the ACL. And then we kind of figure out what we want to do at the other receiver position. Cause I just don't think they're going to have the financial flexibility to resign Slayton, unfortunately, which sucks. Cause I like Slayton. I know a lot of giants fans don't, but I personally like him as if you can get him for a team friendly deal. And I don't think his market's going to be crazy anyway. So I think you could, but I just don't even think they have money to sign him to a team friendly deal. So then you worry about what else is going to happen there. So I put receiver ahead of center for sure. I put it out there in the top three and then center. And then I probably close out with, Prioritize prioritization wise, the uh, defensive line and a defensive line depth type piece. It's crazy too, because we're still talking about needing wide receivers right now. And if you're going to sign a player like Daniel Jones to that big of a contract, you're going to get him help. That has to be one of the top priorities. And it's so funny because just two years ago, we were talking about this same thing, only it was Daniel Jones is entering his second season or his third season. We need to get him help. Okay, let's give $72 million to Kenny Galladay right. and draft Darius Tony. And then neither of those two worked out. So hopefully the Giants have better luck moving forward because you need to be able to threaten defenses at all three levels. You need to be able to create explosive plays. And those are right. kind of things the Giants have struggled with. And in, with this Brian Dable offense, man, Mike Kafka's offense coordinator, at least last year, hopefully this year, knocking on wood, bro, you, you just, you need that ability and that will just to, to stretch the, or stretch the defense. And that will just take your game, your offense to a whole nother level, which will assist Daniel Jones in actually completing some of those passes down the football field. If he had some, maybe some more reliable targets. And they have to be careful about it too, right? Because the giant, the giants have a history of this under Jerry Reese. They went insanely skill position heavy yeah. at through the drafts and I, I once did a piece on this at somewhere either on Twitter or 24 7 sports and yeah there's some bad luck with injuries with Knicks and Manningham and Cruz or what, not Cruz he wasn't drafted I mix and Manning and Manningham but there's also a shit ton of busts in there Ramsey's Barton Jarnell Jernigan Travis Beckham and even with the injury guys it's like well they're skill position players they have a higher chance of injury and they have a lesser chance of staying good as they get older versus these offensive linemen and, the, and positions like that so And like you just said, they did it already with Gallo and Tony. So they have to be really careful with that because we still know in the end, it is all about the offensive line, in my opinion, and the quarterback. And I know you agree with that as well, Nick. Look at the the Eagles added some skill guys now. They traded up for Devontae Smith. They signed, uh, they traded for A.J. Brown, but they also have a dominant offensive line. And they didn't even really use A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith. And they won a game by 38 to 7 against the Giants last week, basically because their offensive line absolutely dominated and their defensive line dominated. It's crazy. And I hate the fact that the Eagles are the blueprint to success right now, but Howie Roseman has done an absolutely excellent job building that team. And he's had misses in the draft. Despite missing. Yeah. Despite massive yeah. misses. He's done that. Right. They could have just, they could have Justin Jefferson right now. They probably wouldn't have and AJ Brown. He signed a quarterback yeah. to a mega deal that they don't even have Carson Wentz. Like, it's, that's usually it's, a big mistake. 
Exactly. But still, they were resilient and they, and they figured out a way. And they're one of the best teams in terms of yeah. their front office at figuring out a way and maneuvering the cap. Jim Henry asks, linebackers are awful and edges aren't the best setting the edge. But don't Dex and Leo have to be better in the run game? They make way more plays in the pass game, which is more important, but they aren't good run defenders. Or were they spent because Justin Ellis was the backup? Yeah, I think Dexter Lawrence is a really good run defender. And I think Nick and I have done a decent job breaking that down, at least on film. Um, he's really good in that in that you know phone booth area. And sometimes he even makes plays sideline to sideline. We've seen it not just with him chasing down Baker Mayfield earlier this season against the Panthers. There was also examples of him making plays in the run game where he's going you know from the nose all the way over to the end of the tackle box. Leonard Williams, to me, did not have a good year defending the run, but also at the same time had a few moments and played through an injury. And it's so hard to gauge like what, how much the injury impacted him. Um, I just think in the end, like t most of the teams found success running away from the giants, not running at the giants. A hundred percent. Yeah. They weren't really doing what we saw Jason Kelsey do to Justin Ellis. Like no team was doing that to the mm -hmm. giants. There wasn't a lot of successful. We're going to attack the a gap. The only time they attack the B gap is when they stretch the giants defense. And there are so many plays throughout the film where Dexter Lawrence was able to work from whatever position and get to that B gap. I think Dexter Lawrence is a excellent run defender. And I think Leonard Williams is a good run defender as well. I think he was playing through an injury, as you said, but the giants, man, they were in nickel and sub packages so freaking often where those linebackers weren't always in position, which puts such a, such a, a lot more pressure on those defensive linemen to make the plays. And when the linebackers aren't in position, the defensive linemen aren't there to make the plays. It's like you have the safety coming downhill and you have these smaller defenders who are trying right. to, to make these stops near the line of scrimmage or four or five yards down the field. And sometimes that would result in eight, nine, 10 yards down the field, making the run defense just not as formidable as maybe it should be. But I really think it starts with the linebackers rather than the defensive linemen, because I think Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams are fine. Like we said, power gap is what killed them counter specifically. And a lot of the times you have on a counter run, just the offensive line block your three technique, your four eye technique down. So they can't really, unless they penetrate those gaps, that are really right. tight, they, you know, they're not going to have an effect on the play. It's going to be on that edge rusher to set the edge and the linebacker to scrape over the top of all that trash, put position himself in the hole, as well as the contained defender and the alley defender coming down. It's on those defenders, which it's not Dexter Lawrence and that's not Leonard Williams. And that was the biggest liability with the giants rush defense. Yep. David Goodman asks, I believe the team missed Nick Williams after his injury. And as they didn't really play 3D lines, 3D linemen the rest of the way. Any ideas on free agents to target for that role? In addition to linebackers, they desperately need defensive line depth. Yes. Yeah, so I actually wrote about that recently for Big Blue View about Nick Williams being kind of a, a a low key injury that we didn't expect to have such an impact on the Giants. They tried to still use base, David, but it was Justin Ellis subbing in and it was Henry Mondu subbing in, which Nick Williams is a far superior player than those two, in my opinion. And he tore his biceps against Seattle. That's when we lost him. So they went into the bye week and they came out and they didn't they didn't have the money to sign any free agent and bring him in and get him ingratiated in the defense. So they were like, all right, Henry Mondu, you're here. Ryder Anderson, you're here. Justin Ellis, you're here. And those three, you know, I respect to them, but they're not there. And in terms of the free agents, look, there are a lot of veterans. I don't think the Giants are going to A, have maybe the money or these team or these players would even want to come to the New York Giants because a lot of them kind of are Philadelphia Eagles like Fletcher Cox and Brendan Graham. Brendan Graham's a little bit more of an, an edge rusher, I guess you can classify him as, but he has a lot of success kicking inside, specifically on passing downs. Dalvin Tomlinson is a player who is going to be available. You know, he's loves New York. I don't think the Giants are probably going to give that type of contract to a Dalvin Tomlinson, although I would love to see him. I'm wondering what he would garner on the open market. And then there's players like Matt Ioannidis, Ashawn Robinson, players who I think would would be solid additions. I just don't know where Joe Shane is going to gauge the veteran defensive linemen and what they're going to allocate towards those types of players when you have to worry about your own. I don't know if the Giants are going to re-sign Julian Love. Daniel Jones will more than likely be back, but on what contract? Saquon Barkley. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but I do believe it would be smart to go out and sign a veteran defensive lineman and probably add somebody through the draft. I know they added DJ Davidson last year, Dan, but I don't know what to expect from this kid. And remember, he, he's going to be like 26 years old. Right. Like he's 25, 20, he's an older guy coming off of an injury, even though this was his rookie season. And I appreciate how big he is and stuff like that. And I felt like he was okay in preseason. But I just think the Giants need to upgrade probably all three of those spots behind Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams. Because I'm sorry, man. Those other two, they're developmental at best. And then Justin Ellis is just over the hill. 
Yeah, and I think you brought up some names that intrigue me. I mean, Matt Ioannidis is the player whose game I really appreciate. But I also think ultimately what will happen here is what we've seen happen throughout the last several se- off seasons with the Giants. They'll sign an Austin Johnson type. They'll find a Mario Edwards type, something like that. And those have been hits so far. It seems like whatever the Giants have done from the scouting department, they really have always had a good jo- good eye for interior defensive line talent, in my opinion, over the years. And I think it bears out in all the players who have been through this system. Now, the one thing that bothers me, and not bothers me, but yeah, bothers me, is, you know, you have to reconsider everything. Like, everybody has has kind of walked it back and been like, you know what, actually, Dave Gettleman was right when he traded for Leonard Williams. I don't really care about the third-round pick he gave up and that contract because it didn't really hit for the team that drafted him because we got Leonard Williams, right? Well, guess what? If they didn't have this Leonard Williams contract against the books and that $33 million against the cap that he's going to count, they could just sign Dalvin Tomlinson for probably like 11, 12 mil against the cap, have $21 million in cap space to spend this offseason on something else, and I don't know if there's that much of a drop off between Leonard Williams and Dalvin Tomlinson right now. Yeah, there's a drop off, I guess, like on paper. Pass rusher. Sure. On pen, and as a pass rusher on paper, it's a drop off, but then he's also a much better run defender, in my opinion. So the overall drop off to me is certainly not 21 million in cap space, AAV. That's one year, yeah. right? And so these are the issues when you do things like trade for a Leonard Williams and give him this mega contract and then kick and then have it be like a 1 million cap at the first year. So all the money is at the end. This is the type of stuff that, you know, we were talking about when the trade was made because they lost all leverage in contract negotiations by making that trade since he was an impending free agent. You have to think about all this kind of stuff with those kinds of moves. Like it can't just be we trade for player. He's a good player. All we give up is third round pick. It can't because that's what happens now. It's coming to fruition. Like I'd love to have Dalvin Tomlinson right now for 12 million against the cap next year. Leonard Williams off the books and use that 20 million to upgrade the wide receiver or interior offensive line or corner or resign some of the players we might not be able to resign. That's not an option now. So, yeah, I think they're going to have to go bargain basement uh, shopping there at the li- at the interior defensive line position. Hopefully they get somebody who really likes Andre Patterson or somebody who has some untapped yeah. potential and then Patterson can get the most out of them. And that's one of the coaches on this staff that I believe can get the most out of the players. But we have a question from James Duncan who asks, if I one more final correct, thing on that, Nick, before we get into that, all right. think about all the players the Giants have done a good job of bargain basement signing at the interior defense line position. Austin uh, Johnson, Matt Edwards, all those guys were former mid round picks. Austin Johnson was a second round pick. I believe Mario Edwards was as well. That's kind of, I feel like that's where they found their value. Like these guys, oh, they'll cast off. They weren't that good. They were high picks. They're kind of disappointed in their former teams since they drafted them high, but then they found them and they put them in a new system and they revived their careers. So I think that's where you'll look maybe. And I'll start to look into those players, like players who were drafted second or third round into your defensive line, just finishing off their rookie contracts with a, with a team where things didn't work out for them uh, with their former team. Absolutely. James Duncan asks, if I recall correctly, you grew up or at least lived in Morristown. We both did. Would love to hear a take on Cluck U Chicken. I have fond memories of that place from high school. So I never had Cluck U Chicken. Did you? I've actually never had Cluck U Chicken and I see it. It's it's in it's near the green. It's on the green, I think. It's over there. I don't know why I've never had Cluck U Chicken. I, I think big big reason is if I drive 10 more minutes down the road, I can get to Nam Keen which is a much better fried chicken place in my opinion. And for those who don't know, it's I believe considered Madison. It's right on Mad- it's right on that main street uh, in as you get a little out of Morristown into Madison. But the Namkeen is just in a phenomenal phenomenal fried chicken place and for me quality is a big factor in fried chicken and I feel like the quality of clucky chicken is not as good as the namkeen for example obviously it's much more expensive namkeen so you have to factor that in as well but yeah i i have had cluck you chicken in the past a, a place i used to grow up uh ordering from master pizza in livingston new jersey when i used to live in west orange new jersey they used to make a buffalo chicken and a barbecue chicken pie which was literally just basically a, a pizza a pizza base with like an insane amount of cluck you fried chicken on top of every slice like i'm talking every square inch of pizza was covered with cluck you chicken either in a barbecue or a buffalo sauce and that was phenomenal it was one of my favorite pies ever it was one of the greatest values in in, in history for a kid growing up not having at the time when you didn't have that much money you buy like a large buffalo chicken pie for master it's like 20 bucks and you get like a fat pizza with just stacks of cluck you chicken on it um and that was great then so i would imagine i like cluck you chicken based on the flavor from that but no i never really had it james says he grew up in summit and are there any other favorite food spots that you guys want to shout out on the pod that you can like go and maybe watch sports at 
Yeah. Um, well, look, I would say not to watch sports, but Namkeen, you should definitely try. That's a, another chicken place. Um, other spots in the Madison area, there used to be a place I loved called uh, Marie's Italian Specialties, but she, I don't know what happened there. Like, it closed. They had incredible drunken chicken. It was on, like, Guy Fieri's show. Like, it got, like, driver dining and dining. And then just randomly, I, I saw, right, a few, I guess a year ago, it closed or something. I was like, damn, because that had a great drunk chicken sandwich, chicken cutlet, mozzarella, um, vodka sauce, a really good vodka sauce on it. So, I don't know. I'd have to think about this one a little bit more. We got a great question, though. Same from James Duncan. Hypothetical. What three retired players would you and Nick add to the Giants for the next three years? For the sake of content, let's say one Hall of Famer, one past Giant, not LT, and one non-Hall of Famer and no quarterbacks. Okay. Three retired players. No LT. One past Giant, but it can't be LT. Okay, so one Hall of Famer. Okay, no quarterback. I'm trying to think about this in my head. So one Hall of Famer that's not a quarterback, and I can add it to the current. We're adding this to the current giant team. Is that what it is? Yeah, so you can add them to the current roster right now. Okay. So given their needs, I think I might add Prime Ray Lewis to this roster right now. He's my <laughs> Hall of Famer. Prime okay. Ray Lewis. So that's awesome. I'm having a lot of fun there. Uh, a past giant that's not LT. Mm, let me think about this one. Past Giant, Harry, not LT. Harry Carson. I was thinking just beef up this linebacker unit and throw Harry Carson in there as well. I yeah. was thinking about Carson. That'd be pretty fun to just have Ray Lewis and Harry Carson on this team. But at the same time, it's tough because if I could throw in, let's say, Michael Strahan right now to this defense, and I know we have some edges already, but we we really only have one edge that I'm staring on with Thibodeau. I know I'm going to have the edge set if I put Strahan in. We get much better against the run, and I'm going to have pass rush. So I think I'm ultimately going to go Michael Strahan there as the non-giant LT, and then a non-Hall of Famer. Non-Hall of Famer. Maybe for a non-Hall of Famer, because I don't think he's made it yet, and I don't know if he will. I'll throw Calvin Johnson in at wide receiver. Yeah, I like that a lot. So Calvin Johnson, I think, is in the Hall of Fame, though. Oh, did he make the Hall of Fame? I didn't even realize that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure Calvin Johnson is in the I Hall can't of Fame. Go Johnson. Let me go somebody else. Let's go. Mm, I'm thinking receiver, but I'm thinking non-Hall of Fame receiver. I don't know, actually, because I was I don't want to do a Randy Moss is in made the Hall of Fame already, right? Randy Moss is in the Hall of Fame. Okay. Yeah. So like for me, it, it would be Randy Moss at Hall of Famer, one okay. past giant, not LT. I think I'm gonna go with I really want to go with Harry Carson. So I think I'm going to go in that direction, but my non hall of famer would also probably have been Patrick Willis since uh, I'm going to choose Harry Carson. I might end up just going with Darrell Revis. I don't, I don't think he's in the hall of fame. Yeah. I think prime Darrell Revis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. actually going to substitute that. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't like believe that. he's in the hall of fame right now. I like prime Darrell Revis into this. So those are good picks. It's going to recap. It was Randy yeah. Moss, Harry Carson, Darrell Revis. Boom. Okay. He also said, do you listen to Sheepdogs yet? I know I've commented about them to you before, but cannot recommend enough. I have not, so maybe I'll do that next uh, tomorrow when I'm when I'm working. I'll throw them on. Do you have any like live albums that or live shows? I mean, that you like, or if they've recorded a live album, send them to me, James, because I like listening through that. Uh, also says might not be your style, but I would check out Daniel Donato. The kid was unbelievable when I saw him in an Allman Brothers cover band and has some great solo stuff too. So I'll have to check him out as well. Obviously, you know Allman Brothers, my favorite band of all time. Okay, Matt Dubois asks, the draft comes down comes down to best player available and value, but if you could prioritize solving one position weakness from this roster for the long term, what would it be? Also, what's your favorite wing flavor and best type of fry, straight, curly, etc.? So a lot of wing questions today. Yeah, a lot of wing questions today. The Buffalo Bills got eliminated. What are we doing, guys? All right. So <laughs> in terms of the draft, the best player value or value, but if you could prioritize solving one position of weakness on the roster for the long term, what would it be? I think I might say wide receiver. In my mind, the the position of weakness is a true number one wide receiver. And if I could just snap my fingers like Thanos and then a true number one wide receiver just pops up instead of people getting turned to dust then I think that's the direction I would go. So it's basically like Justin Jefferson's just getting placed on the New York Giants roster. I think that's what I'm going to go. Because the weakness for the Giants wide receivers is the fact that they don't have a true number one. Yeah, I like that. I think that obviously receivers in the mix. 
I was thinking potentially center if they get like a Jason Kelsey type here for 10 to 15 oh, dude, years, yeah. especially given the longevity of that position. I mean, this dude's like in his mid thirties and still playing like he's 22. That doesn't happen ever at the wide receiver position. So just from that standpoint, um, I would even consider, I, I know we have one, but I would even consider if we could just shore up right tackle right now to have Andrew Thomas and like an elite right tackle for the next 10 to 15 years, the giants are in such good shape there as well. So I consider that as well along those lines, if they could find a, a unicorn two-way tight end like a Gronk or Kelsey. I mean a Gronk or Kittle type. Put him right in as well. <laughs> I would take that. No, you yeah. can still use Bellinger in twelve personnel, and you can use him as a fullback. We've seen that H back, but and I love Daniel Bellinger, but I would do that as well. What's your wing flavor? Oh, wing flavor. Yeah, uh, best wing flavor for me. It's close. Like classic Buffalo hot is probably the best. If I had to just yeah, pick one, one that I can only have, but. Parm garlic is if you do a good garlic parm, it's the best one. So, and it has to be wet. The dry garlic parm sucks. So if you do a good garlic parm, it's, it's probably my second favorite, if not favorite, as far as fry types go, I've taken a lot of heat in the past for saying I'm one of the only believers in steak fries. I think steak, these are not my favorite, but steak fries are underrated. They're not as bad as people think. And I like the potato taste, but overall the best fries are probably going to be for me. Have you ever had like the crispy ones at the diner? They're kind of like mid, they're not thin, but they're like mid, middle. I don't know how to pronounce. I don't know how to. I think I know what you're talking about. I yeah. think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Crispy diner fries. I, I don't think it's a bad take. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't really eat French fries, but if I had to pick one, I like Shocker. waffle, waffle, um, sweet potato fries. When's I don't have, waffle, have French but, fries, Nick. I mean, I, it's been a while. I don't, you can't really even think of it, it, right? Yeah, probably not. No, there's it's times so where good. like, you're so good. So, my girlfriend, she would get like in and out and she would have the French fries and I might oh, yeah. like, have like one or two and I'm just like, eh, whatever. Like I, in and out fries are not good though. I completely, those yeah. are the short, the, the shoe string fries. Those are shit. Those are crappy. They're, they're not, they're not they're, no. I mean, I'll eat them, but they're probably not worth the calories. And in, ter in terms of, <laughs> in terms of wings, I kind of like just variety. I'm a big variety person, but if I had to choose mm -hmm. one, maybe honey barbecue. And if anybody wants wings and they live in the North Jersey area, oh, yeah. go to this place in Hackettstown. It's called Marley's. They have like over 300 wing flavors, just like Same. really exotic stuff. Like they have like all the basic stuff that you're going to love. The wings are gigantic. They're, they're really amazing. And, uh, but they have these exotic stuff too. Like there's like, you know, peanut butter and jelly wings and just like all this like crazy cool type of things. And you can like, if you go on the right day, you can buy like, you know, get like what, like. 12 different flavors and it's not that expensive and you can like diversify yeah. it. So if you love wings, Marley's in Hackettstown, New Jersey is a great place. Great place to go for wings. All right. We're going to wrap up there for the first part of this mailbag. Uh, obviously there were a lot of questions this week. It's the end of the season. We're going to do more mailbags, either one or two more. We'll spread them out a little bit, but thank you for all the questions. And if yours didn't get answered, just know that it will be answered on the coming podcast. So have a great rest of your week. We'll talk to you soon and go giants.